the of the of the uh, Shaul and his sons in order to bring them back to their ancestral land for burial. It says in the text of Shmuel, they took down the bodies, burnt them, and buried the ashes in, in the bones in Givat Shaul, right near the, the central bus station in Yerushalayim. Got that? They took down the bodies, burnt them, and buried the bones in Givat Shaul. That's a violation of the Torah. The Torah says that you're supposed to bury bo the bodies, the goof, not, not the bones. We don't burn, we don't, we don't cremate. So you might say something like, or oh, the Horah Shaul, like the Radak says that the bodies had de decomposed so terribly that the Philistines were terrible conquerors. They would, they would string up a king for, for months and, and, and let his body just dis, dis, disintegrate. So they couldn't, they, they, it was just, the body had so decomposed, ugh, they, couldn't, they couldn't carry the bodies way down from Beit Shan all the way down to, to the center of Yerushalayim. Impossible, right? So as such, they, they, they burnt the bodies. Now, in Divrei Hayamim, in Divrei Hayamim, it says that these valorous men of Givat, of, of, um, of uh, Yavesh Gilad, took down the bodies, made a burning for them, and carried the bodies to Givat Shaul to bury them there. Hear that again? changed around the text of Shmuel to say not that they burnt the bodies. You ever hear they made a sreifa? Making a sreifa for a king was a very common thing of respect. You burnt some of his personal effects, his saddle or some other things like that, right? So, so um, here, is, here is the upshot of Targum, which is that the Targum to the Shmuel Pasuk, get this, this is, hold on to your seats. The Targum to the Shmuel Pasuk is the Aramaic of the Divra Hayamim Pasuk. Not they burnt the bodies and buried the bones in, 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 in Givat Shaul. It's the Aramaic of they burnt the bodies, they, bur they, burnt, they made a burning for the king and buried the bodies in, in Jerusalem. Not Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was conquered by David later, but give it and give it show. Right? It's fascinating. Another quick example of this is that it says that Shmuel and David, for that matter, wore an ephod bod. Now, the ephod bod in the Torah is the is the Kehuna Kohen Gadol. David and Shmuel are not even Kohanim. What are they doing wearing the clothing of a Kohen Gadol? So in Divrei Hayamim, on both of those psukim, it doesn't say ephod bad. It says mi'il boots. Shmuel wore a mi'il boots. What? It says ephod bad. Yeah, but ephod bad is the clothing of a kohen gadol. Right? So it looks sinful. But after Targum Yomason gets his Aramaic on it, ah, oh, it's parav. It's not an ephod bad with a capital E, capital Aleph, like what the Kohen Gadol wears. It just means a, a, a long coat, a frock, an apron. And wouldn't you know it, the Targum Yonason in both of those psukim is kardut de boots. Kardut means a coat in, in Aramaic. Kardut de boots. As if though it's commenting on mi'il boots, the Divrayam inversion, and not ephod bad, the Shmuel version. Do you see what's happening here? This is a common thing that the uh, Divrei Yamim has an agenda. Divrei Yamim loves to absolve the, the Averos of anybody descended from David, and apparently Shmuel too. And what happens? That, so that's a biblical thing. This is my my second thesis this evening, which is: Have I done this? Kol Adam Lekavschus. If it's a good person, try to explain the story in a good manner, right? But be careful. We have to be realistic. If you think, if you explain things in a way that's not realistic, people will, will shy away from it. They'll turn away from it. They won't be able to relate to it. 
if I try to explain everything about Yaakov in nothing but a, uh, a, a phenomenally uh, positive fashion, then I run the risk of, of people feeling, well, I can't. That's the, Yaakov can do that. I can't. I'm not Yaakov. Right? Okay. So, so, um, so this last one is called what, what looks, what appears to be violation ignored by the, by the, the text. But in all, of, I've, I've not, I haven't found, except for this one case where the Radak said, turned Salmaniah to, to uh, something like a barrel, um, I was able to resolve every, everything where I couldn't find a medrash, the Targum Yonason helped me out. Okay, the Targum Yonason always gave a, a, a resolution to the violation. And finally, the only one that, that, where I said violation accepted is where the rabbis agreed that David sinned in sending a peace delegation to the Ammonites. And of course, whenever the rabbis accept such a thing, you can almost be sure that you're going to find some Rishon or some Achron that says that, that um, it is, I find a resolution. Okay, in, the, in this case, the Ereim said it's permitted to return peace to the Ammonites. It's just forbidden to send peace to the Ammonites. Lotidrosh lishlomam. Okay, so I hope that I have given a, um, a, a good introduction to uh, what's what uh, what this this work is about. At its core, it is an anti uh, 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 polemical. It's a polemical work. It's meant to to give a response, a quick, ready response to the hundred or so proofs that biblical critics give to uh, the fact that the Torah was not known at this time. Okay, then you could go on the offensive and show how many times that the Torah is mentioned, Bedafka and Sefer Malachim, Sefer Shmuel, right, Sefer Yehoshua, right? There's also in, in um, is that the, the, um, David, who is married to Michal, right? He's married to Michal. Then she becomes the wife of another man. And then David takes her back. The Torah explicitly does not allow this. Right? The first, the first husband can never take her back. So how does that work? So here too, the rabbis just understood David would never take back a wife that he shouldn't. Right? And, and, if, and if he did, the text should have said so. Again, you're going to say, you really, David didn't have, didn't have a problem with committing adultery and sending the woman's wife, a woman's husband, to die in battle, but now all of a sudden he's worried with Mahsi Gushaso? Right? So that is, I'm waiting for the third week to discuss that. Okay, the rabbis were very creative in resolving David. David may be the most protected biblical character in the Tanakh. I say even more than Moshe. Okay? Rashi, for instance, draws a, 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 a thread with a needle through his Perush al HaTorah for a, a, a series of particular sins of Moshe, all involving the same infraction. Does anyone think what that is? Rashi keeps through Shmos, through Vayikra, through Bamidbar, and all the way to the end of Dvarim. Rashi keeps reminding us of a, a certain th th um, thread that can be woven throughout Moshe's life. And he is so quick to show us, not only, according to what I said in the beginning of this presentation, not only what the sin is and to draw attention to it, but what went wrong in Moshe's life because of that sin. And the sin is one quick English Hebrew word. It's, I'm sorry. I, angry? You got angry? Anger. Is that what you said? Yes, anger, kaas. That Moshe is given to anger, bouts of anger. Moshe himself says so in a, in a uh, famous medrash that appears at the end of Masechus Kiddushin in the Tiferes Yisrael, right? the portrait of Moshe, Shneur Lyman's famous article on, on Moshe admitting that he was uh, uh, morally 
um, deficient, but that he used his free will to change his 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 um, his, his personality. But Moshe was given to bouts of anger. Ramban has a big piece on this in the beginning of Shmos when he kills the Egyptian, and when he breaks the luchos, and when he smashes the rock, and, and, and after his sister dies, and, right? And when he gets angry with Aaron and Parshas Shmini, and he gets angry with with Pinchas and Parshas Matos for the, the way they prosecuted the battle against Midian. This is Moshe's, Moshe's issue. He, is, he has anger issues, right? And Rashi points out at every turn that when Moshe gets angry, he makes some kind of mistake. He's so humble that he admits it all the time, right? So, so, even, so Yaakov is also very protected. Yaakov does some questionable things. Right? But it would appear that David being the ancestor of Mashiach and David being you know, the, the, uh, the author of Tehillim, I'd say that, that must be it. When we can't find the words, we turn to David, who speaks for us. So how could a man like th- this do what's written in Shmuel Bet, Perak Yidalef? Because we don't understand that Perak, says the Gemara. Okay, that's week three already. But next week, we'll be discussing the categories of the perpetrators, right? I gave you a segue now by discussing this about David just now. And um, I would like to have some some questions. I know I said I'd stop a little earlier, but but, uh, the time just flew right by. Would anyone like to ask any questions? Yes, Camelia? I was wondering if anybody ever proposed that when David David Hamelech tried to make peace with Ammon and uh, Moab, that perhaps there was an uncertainty whether they were really Amod, uh, Amon and Moab. Okay, for, w- let me correct one thing very quickly. Is it's just it's just Amon, and while you are correct that in the Talmud, in the fourth parak in Maseches Brachos, there is just such a discussion regarding Amon, but this is much earlier. Remember, you are correct in the fact that later in history. When an Ammonite convert said, I, I want to join the Kehila, and Rabbi Gamliel said, you may not. And Rabbi Yehoshua, I'm sorry, Rabbi Eliezer said, you may not. Rabbi Yehoshua said, you can't, you may, because the we don't know who's, we have doubts about who's really Ammon now. But at the time of that story, those doubts were, were, were not. Uh, not were yet. Not, uh, not, Nothing, not, maybe, maybe the uncertainty, you know, was creeping in. No, the, the Ammonites, Ammonites are, are clearly defined people even after the Chorban Beis Amikdash. The Ammonites were responsible for killing Gedalia. Right, Tzom Gedalia after um, the Chorban. Okay, to my knowledge, that's not an answer that, that, uh, that appears in that story. But it does appear later. Anyone else? No other questions? That means I covered everything? Regarding the Trophim, why can't they just be statues and they only become of the Zara? Okay, so is it this? Okay, so. Don't have a question, but you have to click on the chat to see it. Okay. So I'm coming to read it for you. Why can't they just be statues and they only become of the Zara if the individual has designed them as such? In the case of Michal, therefore the. Sh- just placed regular statues that were not designed as a bodhisattva in the bed. This is this is a, a worth as certainly as worthwhile a comment as saying that they were barrels. Then the, the question just becomes: Why would the text there then call them trophim? Call them slamim. Right? Trophim is a very specific. If you look up in the concordance, it's not used often in the Bible, but wherever it is used. Right in Hosea and Shmuel, and of course in, in the story of Rachel and, and Bereshis, it's 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 about Zara. Right, it was actually quite a. Uh, um, it, it usually had it had two main components. One was for fertility, and one was to tell tell the future, tell atidot, tell me what I something I need to know. And in some, some time periods, it was very cruel about the Zara. They would slaughter someone and cut up the body into pieces and put the body into the, the, ca- the cavity of the trophim and try to communicate with the spirits of that recently slaughtered person 
in order to gain secrets of, of uh, or to know, learn what they wanted to know, right? That, that is a, certainly what the, this question is certainly from, from Nathan, um, is certainly as, as um, acceptable as what Targum Yonason writes. Um, it's just that um, it doesn't explain why the text calls them truffin. Okay, anybody else? You also see aphod, which is coupled with truffin, being used in non avodizar purposes. Yes. So, um, yes, aphod and truffin are indeed by. Um, so the, 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 it's a very difficult pasuk in Hosea. Hosea seems to be um, speaking with sarcasm. It says, if you keep behaving this way, you will not have a king, you will not have an officer, you will not have an aphod, and you won't have. Truffim and what? What are you talking about? An aphod is something I want to have. A king is what I want to have. Uh, but I don't want truffim, right? So he, he bunches together things that you should, you know, you should miss having with things that we never should have wanted in the first place. Right? But I have to tell you that there are prophets that 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 spoke this way sarcastically. Yirmiyahu speaks about times will get so bad, and he refers to different ways that the people would mourn, and listed amongst some of the common ways that Jews mourned was some of the prohibited ways that Jews should never mourn, like ripping out korcha, ripping out their hair, or, or, or gashing their skin, or things like that. The Gentiles mourned that way, not us. Okay, but so, so that's, that's, a, that's a, certainly another good comment from Hosea. Okay. Anything else? Jesse, do you see anything else that I... Uh... No, I'm looking at I don't see any other uh, questions at this time. Okay, okay, great. So uh, but, next week at the same time, we're going to yes. discuss the categories of perpetrators. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, although my work is in the Vim Rishonim, I'm going to discuss some of the characters in the Torah as well. Okay, we're going to do some Yaakov and Esav stuff. We're going to do some Yosef and his brothers. We're going to do some, some, uh, some other things like that to, to learn how the rabbis um, had certain preconceived notions about how certain characters should be treated and how that uh, manifests itself in this, in this work. Great. Looking forward to that very much. Thank you again for, uh, for the shear. And hopefully everyone can join us next week. Um, I know there's a problem with the, uh, the discount code for Kodesh Press. Um, they're working on it. They'll have that available hopefully by the next year. Um, but feel free to purchase um, Harry Schwartz's book wherever you can get it. Okay. My, my office Thank is you. Everybody needs. We have the same discount. <laughs> okay, everybody, be well. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Call to have a good night. Bye bye, everyone.